tarde. Morning. Where's it from? Marcel Dumas. Jackpot. Load him up. We can't have this shit, no one can. I want them back. I don't know shit about that. Let's go. Please. Nah. You don't talk to her. You don't even look at her. Stop. I just want to find them. Can I get a drink? Thank you. Where are they? You gonna let me go, I'll tell you. Are they alive? Marcel isn't a killer by nature. He's a businessman. You just gotta know how to speak his language. You're stalling. Welcome to the Limelight Conversations. I'm your host, Trey D. Williams, and we have a very special guest in the studio today. He's not only an actor, a director, filmmaker, but also the founder of LOAA, Life of an Actor, as well as the owner of Detour Entertainment. He's been in the game for a long time, and I'm proud to call him my acting coach, Mr. Chris Green. What's Chris, up, bro? what's going on with How you, How you doing, man? How's Glad it going? to see you. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Did you do your uh, studying and stuff like that? Did you I do did. your classwork? I'm I did, saying, man. You know, I'm you know. studying my monologues and good, everything. Good, you know, good, good. to tighten up. <laughs> all right. That's all so I did. So what's good with you, man? I'm doing all right, man. Just trying to keep you guys straight, you know, get the, get everybody, you know, looking good and doing well. And, you know, I want to see you guys shine, man. So it's, it's that time, man. It's, it's that time. The industry is changing the... Be more inclusive. So my goal is to whip y'all into shape, man, and get it going. Hey, so. We definitely working, man. We, 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 we work. Good. We good. work. Good. So we appreciate you. Oh, I appreciate you guys. Seriously. Thank you. But yeah, man, we're here to talk about you today, man. So uh, yeah, yeah. we want to let the world know about <laughs> Mr. Chris Green, man. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, you've been in the game for a long time. Obviously, I respect you as an actor and as a friend. I appreciate you doing the show. Absolutely, man. Of course, of course. So yeah, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, man. I know you grew up in New York. Tell us a little bit about that. What was that like? Yeah, man. Uh, born and raised in, in New York, Westchester County, man, which is, you know, uh, Mount Vernon area, which is, if you know anything about Mer Mount Vernon, that's uh, money on this, where Denzel's from. So, um, you know, haven't gotten a chance to work with him yet, but that's coming. <laughs> but, um, yeah, man, I grew up, you know, in Mount Vernon, then we moved to Yonkers, uh, which is where, you know, obviously we just lost DMX. Um, that's oh. where, yeah, 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 man. That's where him and, uh, you know, Mary J. Blige, you know, a lot of people from Yonkers come through, more so in the music scene. And, uh, you know, man, growing up in the, in the 80s, yes, I'm, I'm dating myself. Um, yeah, I'm 80s, baby. Yeah, yeah, you late 80s, though, man. No, you don't I'm count. 80s. You I'm don't, right in the middle. Count. I'm you know, right yeah. in the middle. Man, uh, you look like two years older than me, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, hey, that's, uh, man, I feel way older, man. So, um, But, yeah, you know, growing up in New York in the 80s, man, you know, I, I will say we weren't, you know, my family obviously wasn't, wasn't well off. You know, my, my parents were separated. Uh, but they were in close proximity, you know, maybe 15 minutes from each other. So I got to spend equal time with, with both of them if I wanted to, you know, or, or if, you know, it wasn't a problem like my dad wasn't working or, you know, mom's wasn't working. And, um, you know, I'm not going to paint this picture like, you know, I grew up on, you know, on the block where it's like cats was selling mad drugs and doing all that sort of stuff. But it definitely wasn't, you know, we grew up in the projects. You know, it definitely wasn't um, somewhere where it was, you know, you're going to leave your car door unlocked her keys and nothing like that you know come out on bricks you know Cass was you know pushing a little thing and selling stuff but 
it was still back then a sense of um, community. Like, you know, my neighbors, especially if you were younger, you know, my neighbors were like, boy, you better, I'm going to tell your mom and you know when she get home. And so you, you shook because like, oh, man, I know what that means, you know. So it was it was nice, man, growing up in New York because I think it, it opened my eyes to just not only, you know, being safe and being aware of my surroundings, but just creatively, you know, you had cats out there with the whole, like now when I go to New Orleans and I see cats with the like, you know, drum, even downtown Orlando, they're drumming on the buckets and doing right. all that. Like I grew up around that, man. It's normal. Yeah. So yeah, you know, it was, it was cool to experience that. And then, um, you know, when I was about 14, uh, well, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. Both my parents are from the South originally. So really? my mother is from North Carolina and my that, pops is from Virginia. Right. Yeah. Okay. And they moved to New York and obviously met each other there. So... I would, for the summers, you know, I would always get sent south. I would always get sent to North Carolina to be with my grandmother because my mother's like, you're not about to be out here in these streets cutting up when school's out. I'm going to send you south. And I used to hate it, man, because it was like, there's no blocks. There's no sidewalks. <laughs> just dirt. And I'm like, yo, what is this, man? Like, what? Come on. What a, can't even play basketball. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's no concrete. You're like dribbling on dirt. I'm like, yo, what is, what is going on right now? So, you know, I used to hate doing that. And then it just got one point to where... Um, when I was about 13, 14, you know, um, one of my homeboys on the block, you know, that I would run with got into a tiff with like this Latin dude. And, and if people don't know in New York, at least at the time, uh, Puerto Ricans and blacks, it was a lot of beef, a lot of beef with like, you know, Latin gangs and, and, and black dudes and uh, black gangs and stuff like that. So you kind of had to, you know, pick your side. Mm -hmm. And I was cool with everybody, you know, that's the thing. People tell me even now to this day, you know, as a New Yorker, you're very interactive. Here's the thing. Let me tell everybody and let them know. Which, which is it? This camera here? Let me let you guys know, all right? New Yorkers are not rude. We're just very forward focused. If you stop and talk to somebody from New York, nine times out of ten, they will actually talk to you. Now, if you bore them, they're going to let you know and keep it honest and, and keep it a buck. But there's this picture like New Yorkers are just rude. They just don't talk to people. It's like, no, it's just a busy, a busy city. Even if you're outside of the major boroughs, it's busy, 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 now, busy. I personally busy. thought that as well until right. I visited there. Right. But I understand why people keep it moving. Exactly. Because everybody's trying to hustle you. Right. And you give someone eye contact, they're trying to sell you, hey, here's this mixtape. Right. You know, right. here's this. So right. you have to keep it moving. Right. It's the city it's that the don't culture. for a reason. Right, right. That's why I say, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere because the business sense is there. I mean, Wall Street is there. Right. Like, and they're the ultimate hustlers, you know what I mean? So everyone is, I'm about my paper or I got a goal to achieve. So when it came down to that, you know, I remember this cat, you know, he was like, he wasn't really a big brother. He was kind of like a mentor, but I would just run with him and, you know, hey, I'm the cool kid. When my brother was in the military, my other brother is a police officer. So I was kind of like this single, you know, kid in the sense of, you know, all my siblings are older. So in Yonkers, we run out on the street and on the block. And I remember one day, uh, I didn't see him on the block. And then the next day, I found out they had carved him up. You know what I'm saying? Like Latin dude, he got into a fight. They called his older brother, and this dude got carved up. And then he survived, obviously. But, I mean, they like when I say they carved him, he had, like, he, like sag it from Street Fighter. Like, he was carved all the way up to here. And so at that point, my mom was just like, nah, it's time to go. And so I tell you about she fresh prints me. Basically, she, we moved to North Carolina. She was like, yeah, you got to get out of here. Because that's not about to happen. So I moved to North Carolina, uh, went to high school there, and it was a big transition because I went from New York and this melting pot and this gritty to the most John Deere redneck white high school you could think of. I, like literally cats was driving tractors to school. <laughs> like you laughing, I'm dead ass, like driving tractors to school. And I'm like, yo, what is going on? Like I got to get out of here. Like this is not going to work for me. But... I'm grateful because as an actor, that was probably the best tool to have because I go from north to south and, and that culture shock and that difference. And then not only that, going from high school to college, you know, going to an HBCU, so going from an all white high school to an all black college, it as an actor taught me, you know, to be open, to be understanding, to be empathetic, but also be a sponge to, to soak stuff in, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, man, it, it, it allowed me to, to never obviously forget New York's always going to be home, but also remember where I came from and, and all the people that I've run into in, in, um, in that aspect. So growing up in New York, man, I tell people all the time, like it, now today, would I tell people to raise their kid there? Absolutely not. But I will tell them 
when you, if you've raised your kid in there, like a, as a teenager or, you know, definitely studying, like going to college, absolutely. I think everybody needs to go spend at least a year, a solid year in New York. And, and I think they'll realize how, um, how your work ethic will change. Because like you said, when you go there, like you have to be on point. If you're not, you're going to get run over. Yeah. 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 And, or you're going to get taken advantage of. Right. So it's like, you, it'll teach you to be on your P's and Q's for right. sure. So it was great, man. And I think every city, you know, everybody has that thing of, oh, New York is, you know, y'all think y'all are the baddest and the best. Like, everybody has that. Right. But I think culturally, New York has influenced a lot, whether it's, whether it's hip-hop, whether it's dancing, for sure. You know, theater, for sure. Right. Movies is kind of like, you know, it depends. It's hit or miss. I mean, you've had some great movies that were filmed in New York. But, um, you know, and definitely like Law & Order, obviously, TV shows. But I think on the aspect of just motivating people is definitely one of the bigger, you know, in my opinion, the only city for motivation. Um, even when you look at, you know, the tragedy behind 9-11, but the motivation the whole world had after that, mm -hmm. because it was kind of like, you know, those towers represented growth to a lot of people. Right. You know, it's like, oh, the Twin Towers is like, man, that's like iconic. When you see the skyline, you have to think of that. And then to see those things not being there, you know, a lot of people were up in arms, a lot of people were pissed off. But even if you weren't from New York, you understood, like, nah, this ain't, this ain't a good look. Like, now we have to do something about it. And so I think it's definitely a city to, to motivate you. And, um, yeah, man, you know, it's, it's, I go back. Obviously, my family's still there. So I go back every year and, and see it. And it doesn't go away. It's funny because people are like, you don't have an accent. I'm like, yeah, let me, I'm back in New York for like two weeks. <laughs> I'm a, he's like, oh, who is this guy? Who? Well, we can always tell in class when you've come back from New York. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> we can hear yeah, especially when the, when the curse words start flying. Yeah, that, that happens. So I, I got to mind that. But I love it, man. But the food is second to none. I don't care what anybody says. I've been to so many different major cities. I've been fortunate enough as an actor to travel because you know as well as I do in our industry. Um, you know, when you get certain roles and go to certain places, you can do, you know, you go to different places. You experience different cultures. I got to tell you, man, I don't care what nobody says. New York has the best food, period. When it comes to pizza, when it comes to Jamaican food, when it comes to Chinese food, Italian food, by far. I mean, unless you go to these native, like unless you're going to China or Italy or Jamaica, I'm like within the continental U.S., yeah, you're not be, I don't care. I'll put anything. I'll do the Pepsi challenge with that. Like Denzel say, I'll do the Pepsi challenge. <laughs> nobody is beating New York food. Period. That's the one thing I miss about it on a daily. If I miss anything about New York, is the food. The food is, yeah. See, now I got to now I got to book a place. <laughs> got, got, got me hungry, man. That's what's up, man. But shout out to New York, man. Always, always, Big man. Apple. Yeah, I love it, man. I love it. So, so at what point? So, it, you know, in upbringing, at what age did you get inspired? Like, what age did you say, "Hey, I want to become an actor"? Oddly enough, man, I didn't do that until I was about twenty or twenty-one. I got, I'm a late bloomer. I got into the game late, man. And um, this this year actually um, marks 20 years that I've been an actor because technically years. technically I started in 2001 I started right after um, the towers fell so this year will mark 20 years um, but I was always around it because my, my my mother was always into watching soaps and stuff like that so the backstory behind um, for those who are familiar with me from from watching your show here um, or just know me through you uh, the Superman thing came from my mom's. My mother was a huge, huge Christopher Reeve fan. Mm -hmm. And before he was Superman, he was on the soaps. And everybody know out there, you know, and this, this is a cultural thing. I'm sure all women watch soaps and all that stuff. But everybody know out there in a the black household, you, you go in there and interrupt your mama while she's watching the soaps <laughs> and see what happened. You, you going to get slapped, literally slapped in the next week. So General Hospital. all day, like Young and Restless, Motor Booth, like, hey, they ain't playing no games with that. You know, you know. It was my grandma and my family. Exactly. She was the one who used to Listen, watch. if you want to get away with murder, literally <laughs> let them soaps come on. That's when you sneak out the house or you go get that snack you're not supposed to get because they ain't paying attention. Mama, grandma, they ain't paying attention. And um, my mother, Christopher Reeve, apparently had done some soaps and then he obviously had done movies before. And people don't realize he was, he was actually a very versed actor. But everybody knows him from Superman. Right. And uh, he, you know, my mother fell in love with him. Like, he was the epitome back in the day, tall, dark, handsome. Like, Christopher Reeve, I think, was like 6'1 or 6'2, something like that. He was tall. And, you know, he wasn't necessarily bulky, but he was just that, you know, he had that charisma, blah, blah, blah. And the second Superman was out in theaters. And back then, you know, in the 80s, movies didn't go to movie theater for a week and then come out on digital. Obviously, they didn't have all that. Like, movies stayed in the theater for almost two years because they had to make their money back. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, it came out in the theater, I think in like 81 or something like that. And obviously, you know, uh, my mother, my father, they were married prior to, and when they got together, they were like, oh, good, we can't, we're not, we agree, we're not going to have any more kids, everything's cool. And then, of course, she gets pregnant, my dad was super pissed, because he was like, I thought you said you couldn't have any more kids, and blah, blah, blah. And the way the story goes, as my mother tells me, is she, you know, was in the theater and pregnant with my godmother, and they were watching Christopher Reeve, oh, ooh, Superman, blah, blah. And about halfway through the movie, I decided it was time to vacate. So uh, my mother's like, some ain't right. So they rushed to the hospital, you know, and, and I was born. And uh, I was supposed to be a third. So my father's name was Robert Louis Green Sr. And then I have my brother as a junior. And so I was supposed to be a third. And my mom was just like, no. So apparently she was so upset that I interrupted the movie. His name's going to be Christopher. So I'm named actually after Christopher Reeve. So that's where the Superman thing comes from because after that, you know, she started noticing, like, I was reckless like every other kid, you know, tying pajamas around your neck, jumping, and I would jump from bed to bed. And there was one time, I, I don't even remember this happening, but I guess I was maybe five or six years old. I was jumping from bed to bed, and I jumped. And if you have ever lived in an apartment building in a major city, New York, Chicago, whatever, they used to have these old cast iron radiators for heat that you would have to turn to turn the heat on. And then when I say cast iron, like, you could hit these things with a hammer and not put a dent in them. They were like hard. And apparently they were in the middle in between me and, my, me and my sibling or I guess my sister, we were sharing a room and I was jumping from bed to bed and my mom was like, you better stop, you better stop, you better stop. And jumping, jumping. And I overshot the jump and face first into that cast iron and knocked these four front teeth out. That I, that I, the teeth that I did have, I knocked them out. Blood's everywhere, my sister's tripping out, blah, blah. My mother said I sat there, I didn't even cry. I just looked around like, what? What's the problem? And then started jumping again. And so she's like, you really must be Superman because you didn't, like, nothing has bothered you. So fast forward to that, she was always watching shows and TV stuff. My dad was always in the movies and VHS and always in the music. So I was always around the industry, but I never really had a desire. Like, I don't want to be an actor. Like, it's cool to watch that stuff, but I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And then a buddy of mine in college, um, J uh, Jordan Purvis, uh, he, I think he's producing now actually in LA, but he was going to North Carolina School of Arts, which is right around the corner from where I went to school at Winston State University. And he called me one day, he was like, hey man, we need extras for our thesis film. Mm -hmm. I was like, what the hell is an extra? He was like, you just gotta sit in the background, man. I was like, man, I ain't, that's stupid. I ain't no, I don't do that, who cares? He was like, it's gonna be girls there, you get fed and there'll be drinks. <laughs> hey, what time, uh, what, what time you, what time you said? Two, two, I, I'm, too. I'll meet you over there, he too. To speak your language. He had to speak my language. <laughs> and there were. There were pretty girls there, and there were drinks and stuff. And the film is called Chicks 101. It's actually still on Amazon. And I'm sitting in the background. And this is when, I don't know if you remember, Steve Madden was big back then with the shoes. Yeah. And I had on these, like, silver. I would never be caught dead these days. <laughs> no problem. I'm sorry, Steve Madden, but nah, hell nah. They were silver, high, like, shiny silver. Like, you remember that Puff Daddy skit, uh, Shiny Suit Man? Yeah. That's what these shoes were. <laughs> And I was wearing them, and it was, but it goes to show, so for any actors out there that are like thinking sometimes, man, being background, you don't have to make yourself stand out as far as like get in front of the camera. Just wear some flashy stuff. I promise you the director will catch you. <laughs> and the director saw my shoes. He was like, hey, and the director called me over, Lavender Gill. He called me over, and he was like, I like those shoes, man. He was like, I'm going to put you in a different shirt. I want you to stand from over here. I was just dancing with everybody. Stand with over here by the bar, and the lead actor's going to come over. Don't say nothing to him. Just now, I'm a background actor. You know that's the wrong thing to do. Every time the lead would come over, what's up? Cut, Chris, Chris, Chris. Just don't talk, please. Just stand there and look at him and not. That's it. It's like that's, all right. That's hard to do. People right. don't understand, man. Right. This is natural to exactly because you're excited. So they would move the camera. They went in for a close and like say you're the lead actor, come up and the actor would come up and this is me. Like I'm out of frame and all of a sudden you see this guy. <laughs> And they're like, the director's like, get this guy out of here, man. So they gave me one more chance. The director's like, you know what, fine, you want to say a line? Just look at this guy and be like, oh, man, burned you, bro, or something. I forgot what the line was. And I did it. And out of all the stuff that I messed up for that day, it was crazy. Both the lead actor and the director came over and were like, you ever thought about acting? And I was like laughing. It was like, no, seriously, you did a good job with that. You should look into it. If it wasn't for Jordan coming in and having me be background, you wouldn't be talking to me. Because that's when I caught the bug. I was like... Well, maybe uh, I'll look into it. And I was sneaking to classes over there at School of the Arts. 
they probably mad because they seen on the camera. But you know, it's, it was 20 years ago. Get over it. Um, <laughs> bill me for the tuition. Uh, but I was sneaking classes over there, and then that's when I caught that. I was like, man, this acting thing is like really cool. Maybe I should look into it. So I was about, yeah, I was about 21. Um, when you know somewhere in that you know in 20s but yeah it, it that right there changes the course of life because i was going to school to be a music teacher mm. and so literally i i changed my major i was like all right you know what i'm gonna go ahead and do this acting thing but it was crazy that that one experience of watching them design watching them do set deck and design the set and seeing what it really took to like i'm wondering i'm like yo how many times is this guy gonna say these lines like they they've already done it twice why are they doing it eight more times and realizing camera setups and moving stuff around right. and it was just like this all this work for an hour movie like that's crazy how long y'all been doing how many days have you guys been doing this and so now and this is back then when they were shooting on film obviously it's a little bit faster process now but then you're also dealing with bigger actors bigger right. budgets you know green screen so people don't realize you know the fact that you know your crew's got to come in and light and sound and set deck right. and do all the stuff they think it's just we get in front of the camera and yeah. go action and do your lines and right like oh we shot it now red carpet's like no yes that's why i tell people you got to be passionate about this man don't fall in love with all the glitz and the glamour stuff fall in love with the work that stuff and if you ask any legit actor or respectable actor they'll tell you that's not why they do it they say if anything that's the part of the process they hate right like there's a reason why like johnny depp he's notorious for that johnny depp has said he'll do the red carpets and then he sneaks out the back he doesn't even to this day he's only watched like two movies he's been in he's like i can't i don't want to be there and everybody's cheering nah i did the work it's done let me get on to the next project right he goes to the red carpet smile and then sneaks around the back angelina jolie i've heard is like that too it's like they don't care about that stuff man a lot of people are passionate about the work right if we can affect somebody or affect some sort of change through our work make somebody feel good whatever then that's the move so yeah man that's when i caught the bug is is then is being background and then being bumped up he gave me a line I actually haven't watched that movie. It's on Amazon. You know, I shouldn't have said nothing because now my students are going to go look at it and try to clown. I think it's on there, but I don't even know if I'm in it or not. I mean, I, I think somebody told me they, they did see it because I had done an interview before. And they were like, I think we saw you. I honestly haven't looked at it. So I kind of do want to go look and see on Amazon and see. But you know how it is, man. It's like you watch your first project and you're just like, I don't know who that is. Uh, mm. You know, so but part of me kind of wants to see it to see. I guess from the progress standpoint of like, man, I'm so glad I don't suck like that. Anymore. You know what I mean? Like, so I kind of, I kind of do want to go see it, but I haven't, I haven't seen it. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure it's still on Amazon. But. Now speaking of first projects, what was, what was the name of your first film when you were like your first lead role? Uh, we don't know about that one. So, uh, <laughs> the first, so the first, the first feature film that I was a lead male role in was actually here in Florida, and it wasn't a short and. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go into detail. It was a sci-fi, but not sci-fi. What, what would you call it? it? It had to do with vampires. I'll, I'll give you that much. Other than that, but you are gonna have it's not on Amazon though. I, I don't know where it's at. We have to go to the library to find it. Better it. be in the trash. That's where it better be. Uh, okay. Um, but you ain't gonna find it. I we all got it. films like that though. <laughs> no, we ain't got films like this. <laughs> we ain't got films like this. I promise you that. I promise you that. Nah, we ain't gonna find that one. Uh, you can, uh, next question. What, what else you got? Yeah, on there? Yeah, <laughs> Almost had you. Yeah, yeah but, but in real talk. So what was the, um, I guess, what was the project that you did that made you uh, SAG eligible? And, and while you're answering that, if you could tell us a little bit about what SAG is right. and, and the benefits of it as well. Sure, sure. Um, actually, I got my SAG eligibility off of a commercial. Um, and I don't know if I, I'd have, that's another YouTube because so old. So this is when Howie Long, the football player, Howie Long, this is when he, before he started really doing a commentary on sport, he was doing like, like most athletes do, he'll do commercials. And, and he did a Chevy commercial. And this was 2000, man, this was, had to be like 2007, 2006. Yeah, somewhere in there. Had to be somewhere in there, like 2006, seven, excuse me. And um, I was a principal on that. And it was a sad commercial. And so I got to, I had a line where, you know, how he's just walking through it, talking to people and he walks by me and he's like, yeah. And I'm like, hey, you know, and just saying that line got me my eligibility. And at the time, I didn't really know what that meant. It was just like, oh, does that mean I get more money or what is, how does that work? Because I shot that commercial in, in uh, North Carolina, actually. So which is a right to work state, just like Florida and Georgia. So I right. was like, I didn't know what it meant. And as I progressed and got more training and started learning more about the business, I realized like, oh, that means that I can join the union and be considered a professional actor and benefits and more pay and protected by certain clauses and stuff like that. 
And so what SAG after is, it's actually SAG after now, but you know, everybody just calls it SAG. But so SAG stands for Screen Actors Guild. And that was primarily just for actors who were doing movies and movies of the week, stuff like that. Anything movie related, big screen, stuff like that. And then commercials, obviously. And then uh, AFTRA, which is the American Federation for Television Radio Artists, they were covering anybody that was on the radio, TV shows, uh, you know, industrial, well, not industrials, but like, um, you know, certain type of commercials, industrials would be under SAG. So what happened was, I think back in 2011 or 12, um, you know, it's on their site, so don't quote me directly, but around that time, 11 or 12, the unions decided to merge. Mm -hmm. And so now we have SAG after. And that covers anything that's basically going to be on TV or on radio or on print, anything involving a camera or recording device, basically the union will cover that. Theater has their own thing. They have equity, uh, Actors Equity Association. But they're sister unions. So basically, not to bore anybody to death, but if you want to, if you're a theater actor and you acquire enough points uh, and time to become equity, as long as you pay your dues and do a good job, I think it's for like a year, if you have a year of good standing with equity, you become eligible to join SAG um, and vice versa. With SAG, as long as you're in good standing, you, you can become eligible to join equity. Now, that being said, you'll still have to do like the theater actor would still have to do a SAG production to kind of you know, right. facilitate that. And I would have to go do like a play, like a, a equity play. But they, they watch each other's back, which is something that I like. And being in the union, you know, I, I, if this is a career that you want and this is going to be longevity, I highly recommend doing it because it protects you, just like most unions do. You know, unions, especially with now, if you're living in L.A. or New York or Chicago or like Toronto, you know, as far as working in Canada, you have no choice because those are union productions, union cities and, and states. And, um, you know, you, you have to, they have to govern by that. So like... You can work as a non-union actor in Los Angeles, but they have what they call a Taff Hartley, which means basically they have to justify why am I hiring a non-union actor versus a union actor this job. And it may be specific or well, well Troy, because Troy can bench 350 and, and the guy we're looking for can't. Something like that. But it's like, okay, well, we need that in the film, so we'll give it to Troy. But you have 30 days from the time you film your first thing. So if you work 14 days on that production, that means you now have 16 of days of eligibility to work as non-union, period. With that production, any production. Once you hit that 30 days, they're going to send you a letter and go, Troy, congratulations, that's awesome. You can't work again until you pay these dues to join the union. Not in this state, at least. You have to go back to Atlanta or Florida or whatever. And that can become a problem. I recommend people to join because when you get into situations where you're working maybe the lower budget of projects that are SAG, they're not going to be working you overtime without paying you overtime. They have to provide certain lodging, certain travel accommodations, certain breaks at certain times. And these are all things that you figured you would get anyway, but anybody that's working on an independent film knows, you know, 14 hours goes like this. And, you know, you'll work 10 hours straight and it's like, I'm hungry, and then you get a hot dog. It's like, no, 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 you <laughs> sag? Nah, I need a meal. So, <laughs> SAG's a great union, man. I mean, they, they have the hiccups here and there, honestly, and things that they're working on. But the one thing I'll give SAG is as a union, they do listen to the actors. So when actors complain, like the biggest advancement I think that they've made is with the residuals in regards to streaming. You know, when streaming became a thing, you know, Netflix, iTunes, Amazon, all these platforms are taking over. The one thing they were getting over on was they didn't have to pay residuals like that. Because mm -hmm. like, well, we can't keep track of who's watching. <laughs> and the actors complained enough to where SAG was like, we got to do something about this. So SAG went in and was like, yo, check this out. You guys got to fix that. So now we'll get residuals off that stuff. Still not what it's supposed to be, but it's better than progress. nothing. Making right. Progress. Going right. And that's the thing that I like about SAG is they, they cover us. It's just like uh, in sports, like the NBA has the, um, the players, you know, the players union. Yep. It's, it's there to protect the players, you know, right. and, and SAG is there to protect the actors. So, you know, um, and I've been a member now for eight or nine years, something like that, uh, somewhere in there. But OG in the game, man. It's been, it's been great, man. It's, it's been great. But again, if, if this is something that you want to do, I recommend joining because it does get a little costly. If this is just a hobby, there's nothing wrong with remaining SAG eligible and you can still get on SAG sets and work, um, you know, at your leisure. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for somebody like myself, somebody like you, like, has a passion for this, it's like, nah, you, you eventually are going to join. You, go all in. you have to. Yeah. Especially if you have families. Like, right. I know you have kids, you know, you're married, I have, I have a little one. It's like, you want to leave something for them because now we're working a job where we get a pension. Mm -hmm. So long after I'm dead and gone, my daughter not only will receive my pension, 
as long as they're still, still showing movies and shows that I've been on, she gets those residual checks. And that's the joys of being in a union. So I know even after I'm gone, like I said, my daughter can go to the mailbox or go check her account. Oh, thanks, Dad, for this 100 bucks that I got from somebody watching Vampire Diaries or whatever. Cool, appreciate it. You know, that sort right. of thing. And I think that's, to me, that's more important than making millions of dollars because it's the gift, being in you is the gift that keeps on giving. I know right. that she'll be covered right. long after I'm gone. And, uh, you know, any anybody else that, you know, I leave as a beneficiary, like if I had another kid or if I go, oh, I want to leave it to whoever. And so, yeah, that's cool, man. I think it's I think it's great to have that on top of the legacy of people get to watch you and go, hey, you know, <laughs> that's that guy from such and such or whatever. Right. So, yeah, the union's great, man. I, I highly recommend it for anybody who, again, is taking this serious and, and it's a passion of theirs. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, uh, and speaking of, you said some of the projects that you've been on, some of the shows and everything. Now, you, your, your, your IMDb is, your resume is, is, is solid, man. Yeah, thank it's you. solid. Thank you you it know, takes a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. got some big credits on there, yeah. man. So, uh, I guess kind of relating to the last question I asked, your first project, what was like, so obviously, you know, when you're starting off the acting career, you're starting off doing non-union projects right. and everything. You work right. your way up. Right. Right. I guess what was your first uh, SAG project, like as an as an actor, like uh, oh. film, film or TV? Because if 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 you look at your IMDb, you can see the pattern, and then right. you see you book one yeah. big thing, and then it was like just That's it was it, it was there up from that point That's on. That's what happens, man. The first, I think, the first. Cyber man, I gotta think about that one. I'm gonna have to pull up the IMDb or something. Um, single, ladies. single ladies, I think, was it. I think single ladies was the first union project that I auditioned for, got cast in. That was my first co-star role. That it was like, you know, I got the trailer and I got the, you know, <laughs> that was I think the first one. And I go back and watch that thing, man. I play a DJ, and I'm like sitting there grinning, and I'm like, and I remember shooting that that day. And single ladies was show on VH1, shot in Atlanta. And it, you know, I was happy because I was like, oh, okay, well, Lisa Ray is. <laughs> and then the one episode that I booked, she's not on. I'm like, I'm like, ah, oh, give me this thing. I'm like, ah, oh, come on, man. Like, that's the whole, I got excited because this was after Stacey Dash. So I filmed the second season. So Stacey Dash had already departed. Yeah. And so I was like, but Lisa Ray, I mean, come on, man. You know, like Players Club, man. Every dude, <laughs> listen, every dude who saw Players Club was like, I'm going to marry her one day. Lisa, I know you're married right now. And all that, but <laughs> just saying. Um, so she, uh, let me stop, man. They were like, get me in trouble. Like, we can't have no more guests like Chris on ever. Um, so that was, but that was the first one. And I remember that was the first time I actually, to be honest, felt like I was a legit professional actor because even the, even the director, when I went in for my fitting, was like, your tape was great. You did a really good job. Looking forward to having you on set. And I was like, man, I've never heard that before. Like, this is cool. So we filmed Single Ladies, and I met a bunch of solid actors who are doing things now. Terry Abney was on that, and she's killing the game right now. Gino Vento is definitely killing the game, and I met Gino on there. I met a lot of... And we all kind of were, like, getting our footing in. Like, oh, okay, this is what it's like to have your own trailer and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And um, from there, man, it, it just it just blew up. Um, I think after Single Ladies was when I think uh, I think maybe Complications came next, and then Sleepy Hollow, or or vice versa. Uh, but then that's when it was started being like, oh, oh, this thing can go, it can go like get nasty with it. Okay, cool, like it can get nice. So, and then it went from there. But I think Single Ladies was the first one where it was like getting an actual call sheet and seeing your name on there with a character name and you know having somebody when you park oh no you park here you're not background you you're cash you park here that was probably the best feeling in the world there and then you know you obviously you hustle and, and progress from there so yeah single ladies was probably the first thing that that kind of opened the door from that non-union and guerrilla filmmaking and all that to you have a set schedule, you're getting paid, you're getting a per diem, that sort of kind of thing, you know what I mean? That's what's up. That was nice. Now, what was it like the first time someone, like, noticed you? Like, they say, aren't you such and such from this show? Honestly, that hasn't really happened until, i say, the last couple of years, man. And, and it depends on who it is. So here's, here's the three times that I'll, that I'll get it. If it is an older crowd, like an older you know, I'd say maybe 40 plus, you know, black male or female, 
they'll look at me and if if I have like a clean like right now you know I'm doing the beard thing again because I don't care I'm about to just get the Rick Ross back but if I'm clean shaven or close enough to I won't clean shave but close enough to they'll look at me and I'll look and they'll look and they'll look and they'll look and then they'll come up to me and you know they go we do we know you from somewhere and I play with people but eventually I know I'm I'm an actor and they're like, what were you? And, and, and that's the worst part is like having to list your resume. You know, like you don't want to do it because it makes you feel arrogant. So for those watching, if, you know, <laughs> you're wanting to learn about the industry, if you see somebody you know that's famous, don't go to them and go, what have you been in? That's, it's almost like going to, you know, going to a woman and asking her what her age is. Don't do that. <laughs> it's disrespectful. Don't ask actors that. Just say, I've seen you in something, but... Let us initiate that, because then we can narrow it down for you. So <laughs> that's what happened with this couple. And I was like, you know, I did a film, and this was in 20, this might have been 2018. Like I said recently, 2017, 2018. And this is so obviously Birth of a Nation had already been out. And I said that, and they go, and then they started talking to me about how impactful that movie was when they saw it. And I was like, all right, cool. So if it's somebody older, it's that. If it's somebody, if it's a young female between the ages of like, 16, 17, all the way up to 30, which by the way, when they come at me, I'm like, get away from me, go over there, I don't want no problems. But if it's like 16 to like late 20s, it's Vampire Diaries. <laughs> so they're like, were you? You were the cop on, oh yeah. If it's somebody our age range, it's Atlanta. Because that clip has circulated to where like the BBC did the thing on it and people thought it was like a real interview. Yeah. Harrison looks from the outside to be your average teenager. He goes to school, plays video games, even listens to music in his room. But there's one difference. Harrison, born Antoine Smalls, has transracial identity. When did you know that you were a 35-year-old white man? Well, I've always felt different. And where do you work? I'm a systems engineer for Coca-Cola. Oh, OK. That boy don't work. He go to school, and that's it. <laughs> one day, he said, call me Harrison. I said, who's that? Do you believe that he is a white man? I mean, he isn't. So why don't you think that they get it? I don't think they get it because they don't realize that race is just a made-up thing. Mm -hmm. They grew up having labels, and me, I'm, I'm just not like that. I see. So how do you embrace your identity? I dress a certain way. Patagonia. I wear a thick brown leather belt. I like to envision myself after the surgery. So your, your surgery, that's later this year. I started working at Stonecrest Mall, so hopefully by then I have enough money to take the next step. So you work at Coca-Cola and the mall? Right. Correct. I work at both. Say to other black kids out there who may be going through the same thing. Just be you at all costs. But also, stop dressing so crazy. Absolutely. So if it's somebody in our age range, then it's Atlanta. The first time I saw that, I did think it was real. Right. So, <laughs> so it really depends on how old somebody is to where they'll look at me and kind of recognize. And Atlanta is the one that I'm closest because I have, like, I usually will rock the goatee. So Atlanta is the closest, but so many people I've seen it, and I was shocked. Now I'm starting to get a lot of love from the Latin and Hispanic community because of Queen of the South. Yeah, so, yeah. so that's strange because people will come up to me and they'll say something and they'll say it like in Spanish. I'm like, you didn't realize my character was black still on the show. You know, it's like, I mean, I know a little bit of Spanish, but and then I'll, it'll click, oh, you, you just watch Queen of the South. And like, I've actually had somebody, uh, I was in, last time I went to New Orleans, yeah, because we filmed it there. I actually had somebody from across the street, and I didn't know who they were talking to. Bobby! <laughs> Bobby! And I'm walking, because I'm like, I don't know who they're looking for, but they ain't looking for me. Hey, Bobby! And I turn around, I'm like, who is this person? Like, what's up, Bobby? And then it clicked. I'm like, Bob oh, hey, what's going on? Because I, I, you don't think <laughs> you about that, right? You don't, yeah, because yeah, when we do a role, a we, name, right, yeah. we do a role, we leave, you know, we leave it behind. Leave We're it. on to the next. On, yeah. So it's like, and, 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 and it's a good feeling because it's nice to get that love, but now you think about, man, now I know how, like, Keanu Reeves feels when people rock around, Neo, Neo! It's like, that's, dude, that's not my name, bro. Like, <laughs> stop, you know what I mean? So it's a nice feeling, but it, you know, as you progress in the career, it comes with that. 
And, um, you know, obviously you're, you're definitely going to be experiencing that, especially if I got anything to do with it. I'm going to do as best I can to, to help push you along and keep you motivated. But you already have that ethic and, and motivation. But you'll see once you land that first thing and that character stand out, you, you know, that's a testament to your work. You're not going to be Troy. I think Denzel said that in an interview. Denzel was talking about training day. And he said, how does it make you feel when people come to you? Oh, I despise you and blah, blah, And Denzel said, I did my job. If they look at me and see the character, then I did what I was supposed to do. Absolutely. Now, he obviously, Denzel probably checks people on a regular, but I did what I was supposed to do. But he's like, if you look at me and you just see, oh, that's Chris trying to be, then I'm, then I'm not doing my job. And so when that time comes, you'll see. You'll be out and about, and it won't be Troy anymore. It's going to be whatever this character is, and you got to... You got to take a second to remember because you could easily come off as being rude to them. And that's the last thing you want is people, oh, Chris is a dick. He's arrogant, blah, blah, blah. And it's like these people don't realize, even though we did a good job, that's work for us. Right. So it's like when, when that's done, my daughter don't be calling me about that. Daddy, I need my daughter be running me. Daddy, can I do this? No. Back to All right, daughter. fine, fine, fine. You know, she don't care how famous. I, that, that don't matter to her. She's... Daddy, I need you to buy me this. Daddy, I need you to do that, whatever. And I'm sure the same thing with your kids, man. I love when me in class, your little one comes on the screen, just totally interrupted what's going on. Daddy trying to, hey, and don't nobody say nothing. Hey, go ahead, princess. Do what you, what's up? You want to perform? Go ahead. And you just sit there like, what you going to do? Yeah. You can't do anything. Yeah, you can't do nothing about it. She run it. She run it all day. That's what's going to happen. Just like I'm sure your little men, you know, when they try to get away with something, they go to mama because, yep. you know, they can get away with it. So, but that's Actually, the thing. In the house. Oh, is it? Mom's a disciplinarian. Oh, is she? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad. I'm glad. Because, <laughs> you know, they, your kids probably get to stay up late and all that. She she probably call and check on you. She got to go out of town. They better be in bed. <laughs> yeah, baby, they in bed. They in bed. Y'all go to bed. Y'all go to bed. It's it's cool, man, when you get when you get recognized. But luckily for me, it's not to that point. I will say it's not to that point of being mobbed. Like, I don't shun it. I will I will welcome it, but I can't imagine like what Will and Denzel and like or you know, even outside of the acting, like a Jay-Z and Beyonce, like you can't even you can't even stop at a gas station to get gas. Like I to me, I think at this stage, especially being with your family, like that's one thing about me. If you want to mob me, that's cool. But if I got my daughter around, now nah, we're not playing. Paparazzi can watch all day. They're going to watch the, the most lethal ass whooping in the world. <laughs> because these people have no... It's like they, they just blank out and they just run and come and grab you and blah, blah, blah. I think the, the one instance I saw on camera, I wasn't in person. You know, people familiar with Hugh Jackman, you know, played Wolverine or whatever. People, he seems like one of the nicest guys. There's a clip. I remember, i never forget this because TMZ had put it up. He had just got off the plane with his daughter. And this is at the height of Wolverine, so like everybody knows who Hugh Jackman is. And he had just got off the plane with his little daughter. She couldn't have been no more than eight or nine, maybe. She had to be younger than that, maybe. And one of the paparazzi guys basically almost knocked his daughter over to get a picture of him. And I thought Wolverine Claws was come out. <laughs> you saw for you saw he looked down and he actually grabbed the guy. He actually grabbed the paparazzi by his shirt and then he realized where he was. He let him go and he was just like guys come on but that one little, and because it's a protect you as a parent it's a protective thing it's like right. come on man i got my kids with me in la i realize los angeles is the only place that doesn't have this i guess there's a camera like new york i think it's like 500 feet they're supposed to respect los angeles is the only place that doesn't have that like overseas nev campbell moved overseas and i remember her talking about this in an interview where they can't it's like it's like, they have to have, like, a telephoto lens. If they get anywhere within distance to where you feel threatened, they'll get arrested on the spot. Like, mm. paparazzi over there have to respect that. And they can't be taking pictures in your house. If you have kids with you, they can't take pictures at all. Los Angeles, man, they don't care, bro. They do not care. And that's why I was like, I would never raise a family there. Like, if you were that famous, I don't see how they do it. I right. don't see how they do it, man. It's tough, man. Yeah. I can imagine it's probably what Jordan said on the last dance where he was like, he got to a point where he couldn't even leave his hotel room. Right. And he right. said he felt like he was a prisoner to like right. just being great at what he did. Right. So that's kind of what I would imagine it being right. like. Right. When he was talking about people say they want to be Michael Jordan, but it's like, right. I don't think you, I don't think you understand what that is. Right. No, I agree with that 100%. I mean, yes, it's, it's part of our job. The more we do this. The more people see stuff that we do, and, and hopefully something hits because it's right. a game changer financially. It's a game changer as far as freedom wise to travel and do stuff. But then you also got to think, all right, you know, we got to fly private now. 
you know, we got to book out the whole floor of the hotel room. It depended on, because now you got people that's going to want to, you know, yeah. in this different status. Right. And it's like, they're going to want a piece of you. And, and now you got to figure out how to navigate that, you know? It's so crazy, it's, it's crazy, but that's what we signed up. Yeah. I wouldn't trade it for nothing though, man. I Absolutely love what I do. Not. So. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been in the industry, man, for 20 years now, yeah. man. Not too many people can even say that. Right. You right. know, like that's, that's just an accomplishment in itself. Right. But yeah. I'm sure you've seen, you know, some of the, 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 the best things and some of the, the worst things in it. So, so tell me a little bit about the politics that you've seen. <laughs> I know we talk about this, right, right, you know, class, but, yeah. but yeah, what, what do you see like the most, some of the politics and, and downfalls of, of this industry? Right. At least for me, man, the politics have always been there. I think it's just more to the forefront. You know, everybody knows I'm a huge Will Smith fan and I love the quote that he said recently to where racism has always existed. It's just being exposed now. Like these things have always gone on with the unfortunate, you know, killing of black men and women and children, you know, people of color and, and police brutality. That's always been there. It's just now everybody got cell phones, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody's got cameras everywhere. So I think with the industry, it's kind of the same thing. We're now exposed like with the whole Me Too movement. And I've personally never been on set or experienced that. Also, I'm male. But I've never seen the symptoms in females that I've worked with, and they probably did a good job in hiding it. But with that whole Weinstein situation, when that started coming out, I'm like, yo, the casting couch is real. That's crazy to me that dudes are literally like, you want to be in this film, you got to sleep with me, you got to do this, and blah, blah, to these women. And I'm like, and unfortunately, some of these women have done it because they felt like that was the only way they could get on, but then who are you going to tell? Right. You know? And so the politics in this industry, it's, it's, it's shameful at best, man. And that's why, like, my daughter's in, in the industry, and she loves acting, and she wants to do it, but... I'm glad that I'm in it because I don't care what producer you are, you're getting your neck broke. You know what I mean? Like right. that's, I'm not playing that game, right. you know? And it sucks that people feel pressured to do that. So I think now with the inclusivity, that's a plus. Like everybody wants to be included, whether it's people of color, whether it's, you know, uh, people with disabilities, LGBTQ community, I think all that is great. I think that's fantastic. But there also comes downfalls with that because now I think some people make productions and films and they do it to see, look, we have a gay person, so leave us alone. It's like that person has nothing to do with the script and it's a caricature of what I think you've just did more disrespect to that community just by having them in there and going, this is how gay people are. You could have just not had that character. Right. You know what I mean? So I think it's, you know, there's like the whole phrase you would hear back in the day, the token black dude. It's like every, every once in a while those movies had the black guy where it was just like, what up, brother? Eating chicken, and it's like, oh, so that's that's how we that's how we do. Right. It's like, come on, bro. Like, I can tell you plenty of black people that don't like watermelon. You know right. what I'm saying? They spies like, oh, I would never eat that. You know. But again, movies have to portray what they think sells. Mm -hmm. So when I first got in the game, you, it wasn't so blatant. I think with the caricatures, it was kind of like oh, we just need a, a black guy for this role. But then when you get on, then they want you to do all this stuff. Um, it's kind of um, akin to that, that Dave Chappelle interview mm -hmm. where he, I think it was on Oprah or whatever, and they were talking about trying to get him in Blue Streak to wear a dress. He was like, I'm not wearing a dress. For what? It doesn't make the scene that much more funny. And if so, then go find some dude that'll want to do that, you know? Right. And, and I, totally, I totally believe in that 100%. It's like, if you can explain to me how it adds value and truth to this, that as an actor, cool. But if you're just trying to sell some tickets, nah, I'm not the dude for you. You know, right. you got to find somebody else. So seeing how actors, I felt like, had more say then, and you fast forward to now with the advent of social media. And everybody knows, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to shy away from it. Social media stars, man, they have their lane, but it's proven time and time again. Just because somebody's funny on social media for a minute don't mean you carry a film, don't mean you carry a TV show. We train at this. Right. You know what I mean? If anything, it's, it's like we were talking about earlier about the fight, right. the, the Jake Paul fight. <laughs> this dude trains boxing for two years. Now he thinks he's a boxer. Okay, put his ass in the ring with a real boxer and we'll see what them two years have done for him. Right, right now he's beating up on people. that if Nate Robinson, come on, dog. He's a basketball player. Right. Now put Nate on the court with Jake and see what happens. Nate going to win that battle. Right. You know what I mean? It, that's, you're out of your element. So when these people come on and they're like, well, I got a millions of likes on Instagram, and then these casting directors and producers think automatically that's going to translate to views. You stick that actor on screen, it takes them 20 takes to say two lines. It's like, 
And so what did you expect? They're not an actor. They weren't trained. Right. You know, they're not a storyteller. Anybody can get on the camera and look good. So I think ultimately for me with the politics, that's been the biggest change is social media. Mm. Yes, it's a tool and yes, you need to use it, but it shouldn't be the tool, in my opinion. Right. And you're saying because the people are getting cast now because they have followers, a ton of followers, but not necessarily having proved that they can act. Right. Right. I've said this before, and I'm paraphrasing, it's not an exact quote of his, but Denzel basically was asked about social media, and he was saying, you know, you're not a good actor because you have a huge following. You have a huge following because you're a good actor. Right. I think that's, that's how it's key. supposed to be viewed. I think that's but key. that's, it's, it got skewed somewhere along the line where it's not that anymore. Now people look at, you got all these followers, so you must be dope. Right. And sometimes, listen, sometimes it may pan out. Sometimes it don't. But then... You know, you look at certain people where everybody's like, well, you know, you could say that about all these people, blah, blah, blah. Like, for example, I, I follow Tony Baker on social media. A lot of people know from social media, but Tony Baker's talked about, and I've actually, you know, listened to him on podcasts, no research. He's, tr- he's trained in stand-up. Like, his background stand-up, he's done some acting classes. I respect that because he didn't just go on Instagram and go, oh, you know, voiceovers. Like, he's trained for this stuff. Right. He's just using that as his platform because it caught on. He's like, all right, cool. He's been in some movies, you know, playing parts, but he's sticking to his lane. And when he learns more, then he'll go, you know, he'll grow more. Right. But you get some people and it's just like, bro, what? Why are you in this movie? You took that opportunity away from an actual actor. You took that opportunity away from an actual actress who could have gone on and given you what you needed and it been good and solid. Um, I, I think... On the flip side, though, like I said, you know, it's allowed, social media has allowed you to create your own content and do stuff like this and get it out there and have your own lean. But like I said, the politics, man, have become so bad with, this industry has always been a money machine. It's always been about the money. But now it's, it's been exposed and people are, the formula's out there, so not everyone's taking advantage of it. And I think that's the biggest thing. I, you know, I miss the days where your reputation came from you actually doing good work, not, oh, look how many hearts you got on this. And we all know that can be fabricated. People buy likes, people buy, like, that stuff can be fabricated, man. Right. So hopefully it'll go back to where you, the industry is seeing the flops by doing this, and it's like, okay, we got to get real actors back in here. I'm hoping it goes back, but either that or the social media people, go get training. It's like, all right, if you're going to do this, go train. Right. You know, go actually learn what it is right. to have this craft and be a storyteller. Right. Because I'm not going to just go show up to the NBA. I could shoot a jump shot. That don't mean they're going to give me a contract. Right. But I got so, so many followers on social media. And? Right. What's that supposed to mean? You ain't going to get us a chip, so it don't matter. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Who cares? I feel like our industry needs to have that same kind of weeding out process, that vetting process. Gotcha. So now, I mean, you know, your career, I mean, you got a crazy resume, man. You know, you got loving, you know, birth of a nation, queen of the South, you know, uh, the list, the list goes on, man. And, you know, you're still booking to this day. Like not too many people can say that, but, um, you know, obviously your passion ran deeper than just the acting. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, you, you found the, the founder, right. Actually, you were in the movie called The Founder as well. <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> it's a McDonald's movie, yeah. And uh, you're the founder, though, of LOAA, right. Life of an Actor. Right there. Yeah, yeah. That's where I train at, yeah. You know? <laughs> and y'all remember that. He said that, too. So when he up there getting that Oscar and forget to thank me, when y'all see somebody get drop kick on stage, y'all know why. <laughs> and then you have also Detour right, right, uh, right. Entertainment as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you've gone to the business side right. as well, but... I think the passion comes through the coaching. Right. So talk about that a little bit. You know, what, what right. made you um, start, you know, LOAA? Right, Where did right. that come from? Right. So, so I'll go to Detour first. Detour actually started first because I got tired of waiting on other people to shoot stuff. So I was like, all right, I'll give the gab, obviously. I'll produce and then we'll create our own content. So Detour is primarily just creating content, you know, films, TVs, you know, commercials, whatever. You know, that keeps me on the producer end, producer and director end. Life of an actor became a passion because I felt like the training that, in particular, and it started originated here in Florida, the training here in Florida for me, it just, it was so par, not in a way that coaches didn't care, but it just was like, I, like, I never understood how you teach somebody to act in six weeks, like the six week classes, eight week class, like how do you do that? 
I, I don't understand. Like, unless that person is doing 12 hours a day every day for six weeks, mm -hmm. which is not the case, right. how is that possible? So, you know, and, and, and I've studied in New York at this time. I had studied in L.A. at this time. It's just like, you know, they, that's not how they get down. Like, they do more conservatory style. Or they, this is a weekly ongoing thing. So I drove down to Miami for Lori Wyman, the audition for Lori Wyman, and, uh, who I'm not a big fan of, and that's okay. I'm okay to say it on camera because she knows that. Um, <laughs> I just don't like her treatment of actors sometimes, honestly. Um, and this is the example. I drove down to Miami, uh, audition for Lori. This was Pain and Gain. That's how long ago it was mm. that I started life as an actor. Pain and Gain, so that was 2011. 2000, yeah, 2011, 2012, somewhere in there. And I had audition for Pain Again. Now, I drove from Orlando to Miami. This was like a small supporting role, a guy at the front desk. He says two lines, but Mark Wahlberg and The Rock are in the scene. So I drove down there four hours to audition. I get there. I open my mouth. She looks at me and goes, stop. This is what I'm talking about. You're not even doing the right scene. I'm like, this is the scene that my agent sent to me. But you need to get the right scene. Okay, well, you're yelling at me. That my agent sent it to me. What do you want me to do? I said, can you give me the scene? I'll go out and come back in. We don't have time for that. Just do the scene. I was like, you know what? Thank you for your time. And I just walked out. Wow. Just walked out on her. Wow. Drove back and not, you know, Twitter was out. I'm, I'm heavy on Twitter always. And I had tweeted at the time, remember those MasterCard commercials? Oh, I think it was MasterCard or Visa. I think it was MasterCard where it was like, you know, um, shoe polish, 10 bucks, pair of new shoes, you know, 50 bucks, um, walking in and landing that job interview, priceless. Like those commercials were out. So what I did, I said, driving down to Miami, you know, gas for that, 70 bucks. Paying tolls on the way, 40 bucks. Driving four hours for a five minute audition because the cast director was a pain in the ass, priceless. You know what I mean? And then I put hashtag LOAA. And so people started retweeting that and laughing, and they were going, you mean LOL? I was like, no, hashtag LOAA, life of an actor. I had no idea it was going to stem into this, because then other actors started retweeting that, going, bro, I feel you. Like, and they started using the hashtag. So I was like, well, maybe I'll do something with this. I mean, I've directed actors, maybe I'll. And then that's when I started getting asked, hey, do you want to coach people? Do you want to take people? And... It was brought to my attention in like 2015, and that's when I felt like, all right, maybe I need to legitimize and, and be serious with this. Uh, one of my clients at the time that I was coaching in 2015 was like, yo, have you, you know, you know you can check where your hashtag is not trending, but like the analytics on your hashtag. I was like, no, I didn't know that. He was like, go look it up. And it was, and it really, you know, brings joy to me. Even now when I say it, it brings so much joy to me. My hashtag was used over in Spain, it was used over in the UK, and it was like to the point to where people were checking other people like, LOAA, Life of an Actor, and they were like, you know where that came from? And it was like, yeah, I did it. It was like, no. And luckily I kept all my, I had my logo and stuff at the time, they're like, and they were tagging my profile. This is the guy that started that. Don't be trying to take credit for his stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> and for me, all I want people to do is like, it's not even about the hashtag or the logo. For me, is I want people to understand the lifestyle of an actor, a true actor and a storyteller, Again, like we talked about, it ain't about the glitz and glamour and all that. It's living life. Like, the best actors live life. You go out, you have experiences, and then you tell these stories to the world and hold the mirror up and go, this is what a mother dealing with postpartum looks like. This is what a vet dealing with, you know, depression and, and postpartum deals like. This is with uh, a post... Um, PTSD. PTSD, yeah. This is what, you know, an athlete who wins the chip after sitting on the bench forever and he made the game winning play like a Rudy. This is what that feels like, you know. That's what I feel like real, true actors who have a passion for it go out and do. And so my job was to create a community of actors through coaching and training of like, guys, it ain't about, you know, and I've studied Meisner and Strauss. I studied all the techniques and I still continue to do so to this day because that's part of our, our tool. It's not about that. For me, it's literally my job is to make you understand that you have to respect this role enough as if it were a person. Mm -hmm. So when you go to tell this story, audiences relate to it, they like it, they enjoy it, they love it, and they feel something when they leave. You know, the win for me, and I tell you guys this in class all the time, the win for me is if you go to a movie theater and people watch your movie or your performance or whatever, and you've won, it's 50-50. You got 50% of the audience that like you, 50% of the audience that don't like you, that's a 100% win to me. Because now when you leave, you're going to have that one guy that was like, Troy was great in that. Troy sucked. 
they're having a conversation about you. Mm -hmm. If 100% of the audience is, is digging you, that's great. That's perfect. I don't know anybody in history that's done that. Nobody. Chino, Mill Street, nobody. I don't know anybody in history that's done that, but that's great. It's when you have 100% of the audience not liking you or less than 50% of the audience not liking you, then there's a problem because th there's no authenticity. Like, they, they saw through the BS, <laughs> you right? So it's like, if everybody's like, yo, if eight out of 10 people are like, yo, Troy sucked, then it's like, Troy got some work to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Chris was horrible, Chris got some work to do. But if you go in there and six out of 10 people are like, yo, I really dug what Troy did, and four people are like, ah, it could be any other reason why they don't like you because you remind them of their brother or something. They're straight hating. But the fact of the matter is you've got the majority of the audience really connecting to what you did. You did your job. Right. And that's, that's what I try to do with Life of an Actor is have actors know that it's a certain lifestyle, taking care of yourself. And I don't mean being like, you know, they ain't got to be like you, you know, Diesel and all that, but just take care of yourself. You know what I mean? Your body is your instrument when you're telling your story. Mm -hmm. You know, take care of it. You know, your voice, you know, your mental, your spiritual, whatever that means for you, religious or spirituality, whatever. You know, finding people that, that, that fuel your creativity. You know, because that gets stifled. As we become adults, man, that gets stifled every time. You know, oh, you're crazy if you're pretending this and blah. Oh, that's not real. It's fake and blah. We don't ever tell our kids that. Right. You know, we tell our kids the sky's the limit. And then once you start getting older, all of a sudden you get told, eh, well, you got to be an astronaut for the sky to be a limit. It's like, well, why can't I do that at 40? Right. But because you got to go through all this training. Well, I got time, you know. So for me, I don't ever want actors to feel like if you don't have this amount of training or whatever or this amount. And maybe it's because I've had other jobs and got into it late. I can understand that. And so, yeah, with Life of an Actor, man, it's literally just creating this community, not a cult. I'm not one of these guys that's like, if y'all don't wear the Life of an Actor shirts, you can't come back to class. <laughs> what? Y'all are grown adults. You know, even at the youngest 16, you know, I'm not going to tell you that. I am going to tell you just respect it, though. Like, when you're representing the brand, I want people to look at it and go, man, Troy's lived an interesting life. That's probably why his characters are so dope. You know, this man's experienced this and he's done that. He's got a family, blah, blah, blah. Don't, don't shelter your life from your work, mm -hmm. but you also don't expose everything. Some things you play close to the chest, you know what I mean? You don't have to tell everything about your life, which is why I don't be on social media. Like, like you won't find a lot of pers any personal stuff on my social media. <laughs> if it's me and my daughter, it's because we're doing acting related stuff. I feel like that's, you gotta keep that personal. And like her wins, I'll celebrate. You know, like I love when I see, you know, I hear you cheering for your son. You could get that role, hey, a proud dad or whatever. You got that on lock. You know what I mean? Because you do it. So you like, okay, this is what that feeling feels like. Let me show the other dad, hey, it's okay to cheer for your son. It's okay to, you know, if he loses, it's okay to, you know, let him have that moment and whatever. I think that's where you don't get with a lot of the training here. Like our training feels like quick, fast. And not necessarily here, just in general in the, in the States. And it goes back to that, the, the British invasion. I think over there, they're taught how to live that lifestyle of work, work, work hard. Like this is a job. This is not a fantasy or a pipe dream. I think over here, it comes more across like, it's a pipe dream. And if you're lucky enough to make it, then cool, you ain't got to work anymore. Right. No, that's when you really got to work. Right. Is when you on top, man. Because right. the only ways you got to go is down. Right. You know? Right. So that's what we try to do, man, and, and the coaching and stuff like that. And I enjoy it. I do enjoy it. I love seeing the light bulb go off when I'm talking to you guys. And you're thinking, and then the bulb goes, and I'm like, yes, yeah, you got it. All right, now do the scene. You know, <laughs> I, love, I love seeing that because that creativity fuels me. And I like seeing you guys win. And that's why, you know, I tell you guys, you don't have to brag about yourself if you want to be humble. I'll go in there and talk mess all day. <laughs> my students are better than yours. Yes, I said it. My students are better than any of your students. I'll put the way, Frank Lucas, man, Pepsi Challenge. Let's go ahead and get it popping. Uh, because I know how hard you guys work. And I also know that I don't allow you to slack off. Right. Because if it's something you seriously want to do, then got to get it popping. Right. You know? And when you know we're slacking off, where you hold <laughs> Y'all know I'm playing, man. Right, it's been many days when I went to my car, punched the steering wheel. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and listen, and but 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 the key to that is, real quick, I'll say that uh, the key to that is that, and just the way my mentor, you know, that that's the studio mentor, Dennis Neal, out in L.A. Shout out to the OG. Shout out to the OG. Yeah, the OG. Dennis is <laughs> Dennis puts foot to ass, but he never makes you feel small. Right. He doesn't belittle you. Right. And that was the key thing he had mentioned to me. He's like, you know, you got to be set the example for your students. You don't want to feel that way. Don't make them feel that way. There's coaches that beat up on their students. 
I don't do that. If I put foot to ass, it's because I'm reminding you, you know you could have did more work. Right. And you chose not to. Right. So don't get mad that you're not getting called in because the person right. next to you did more work. Absolutely. And when you realize that, cool. If I see you struggling, it's like, yo, just work on it. Like, it's right. going to be have those times where we have those step backs. I'm, I'm, I'm never going to beat you down and not pick you back up. Right. If anything, I'm going to remind you, oh, oh, you, you suck? No, I can show you suck. Let me get your first tape from the first day of class. You're like, oh, no, I don't do it. Exactly. You've made progress. It's not the progress you want to be right now. It's, it's, it's going to take time. you got to work on it. Um, so, yeah, man, I think, I think it's as long as you guys are comfortable in doing, doing your job and doing work, and that's on me as a teacher, then, you know, that's the goal, man, is just to make it, you know, to make it to where everyone is, wins and is happy to work with because then that makes it a happy environment. Absolutely. You know, and we need that in these times, man. It's like so, everybody's so mad now, man, and, and rightfully so. It's like we need we need some joy up in here, man. We need some joy up in here. Last couple of questions, man. So uh, as far as working with in the industry, I know you've worked with a lot of the top people. A lot of like who who was um an actor, both male and female. Who who was somebody who you would love to work with right now? One actor, one one uh that I have it. Yeah, that you haven't worked with. I mean, the obvious is on that. You know, Will and Denzel. To be state the obvious, you know, Will and Denzel, of course. Um, as far as like. Who 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 I think is doing work that I would love to be challenged by. Uh, I'm actually really proud of Anthony Mackey, man. I haven't worked with him. I would love to get on screen with him because I think he's allowed to do what he was trained to do. I think he was in that trap that a lot of us are. Where it's like I got to pay bills, so I got to take this role. Um, I definitely like to to work with him. How about uh, females? F- uh, females, man. That's t- obviously again the obvious. Meryl Streep, Viola Davis, the obvious ones. Um, as far as, you know, somebody that I think I could actually get to, I mean, I think I could get to them, don't get it twisted, but that I could probably, in the near future, probably get with, man, um, so many, so many good ones, man. Uh, I can't even really think of anybody off the top, though, that's like, without, like, just one person that's just, like, standing out, and it's, just, it's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta work with them. I'm just trying to think of the stuff that I've worked, that I've watched recently. Tracy, Tracy Ellis Rose. And, mm, <laughs> come on, bro. Come on, bro. That's I would like to work with Tracy, but there's a different reason for that. Uh, man, that's dude. That's a tough one, man. Because it's the females are taking over right now. Honestly, right. the actresses are like, and they're doing solid, solid, solid work, man. Um, oh man, that's that's a tough one. You know what, uh, Leticia Wright. Who everybody knows her as Shuri off Black yeah, Panther. Yeah. But I saw her in Black Mirror. Her episode of Black Mirror, yo. If you haven't seen it, I think it's like the second or third season. Go watch her episode of Black Mirror. That, yo, she, I was like, I need to get on screen with her. She killed it. Killed it. So she's one that I was, if they called me and was like, yo, you know, Leticia is, oh yeah, absolutely, 100%. But I think ultimately Viola is, yeah, Viola's top on that, on that list overall. That's I think I think before, as far as like haste and hurry, Denzel I think is at that retirement point. I think he's just strictly doing directing and producing. I mean he's going to act, but I think he's getting to that point where it's like director chair, producer chair. Like right. I think acting, he's done everything he can do. You know right. what I mean? He's proved everything. Um, but I would like to catch him before he leaves. Absolutely, I think we all would. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But Viola, it's something about when you watch Viola work, man, like if you can't, if you don't become a better actor after leaving that set, I don't care if it's two lines, this ain't for you. Right. Like she is just, she is a monster. And it seems, even though I know it's not because she's put the work in, it seems so effortless, man. Every time she's on screen, it seems like it's just, yep. it almost like she just woke up out of bed and was ready. Yep. Yeah, she's definitely one. I you know like. what's interesting about her, though? She said she finally found, well, I won't say finally found a role, but she has a role that she said she's intimidated by. Oh, yeah. She's playing Michelle Obama. And she oh, yeah, she even course. said, but she said it. I'm like, to hear her say that. Because right. like I said, she makes it all look easy. Mm-hmm. But to hear that human element right. come in, I'm like, I love that. Right. Because, you know, like that's what, like you said, life of an actor, man, We sometimes you have that fear. Right. You right. know, you, but those are the roles you should go for to challenge right. you, you know? Right. right. I think it's, I think in that regard to me, like if they asked me to play, like for me, and it's no secret, I've mentioned that, you know, and when they ask, hey, who would you want to play biopic wise? Honestly, right now, especially right now, I would love to play Tiger, but like start at the, almost the crest of his career and then that downfall and then the rise again. Like, I would love to play Tiger Woods because I think his story is, he's got one of the most interesting stories, in my opinion, in sports. Um, 
because that man, to have the hate that they had for him was like, you're going to predominantly white man's world and here comes this, they consider him black, even though he's mixed, but yeah, we consider him black. And then to see how everybody, the black community, everybody kind of changed on him when it was like that whole stuff went down with his wife and he was basically by himself and then to see him come back and then everybody, white, black, whoever was like rooting for Tiger. Mm -hmm. And now with this instance, they're like, bro, he can't catch a break, right. you know? Um, I think when you're playing somebody that's young and still around, so like Michelle Obama's not, she's not going anywhere anytime. Hopefully, you know, God bless her, she's not going anywhere for a while. You know what I mean? She's around. So Viola's got to get that right because then if you don't, Michelle, you get that phone call. Hey, Viola, um, <laughs> we need to talk. You know, want you come over to the house? Yeah, no, we, we need to talk. You don't, that's the one thing you don't want to mess up. And you don't want to do any disrespect to that either, but it's different when you're playing somebody that's gone and, you know, all you have is archive footage of them. Right. Viola can get access to Michelle at any time. And it's even worse if Michelle's on set. Like, I feel the same way kind of with Jamie Foxx. You know, he's playing Mike Tyson. I can imagine the stress that was if Mike was on set watching and it's just like, all right, let me not. Because Mike's still got them hands. You know, right. you say something wrong. Right. Oh, cut a word. That's, that's, that's how you're going to play me? That's how you're going to play? Okay. <laughs> you know, and Mike punch you in your face. You're you going to feel it. <laughs> so I, I feel like, yeah, man, Viola is definitely on the hit list. And I know a couple of actors who have gotten a chance to work with, and they've all told me the same thing. Like, yo, you coming in, don't be on your A game if you want to. She'll have you crying in there. Like, you know what I mean? But it's, you, can't, you can't disrespect her like that. She takes it seriously, man. You can't. She She's by far, when Meryl Streep sits there and says that you the queen, and this is Meryl Streep, who's, there's nobody doing it better. On, male, on the male or female side. Right. Like, in my opinion, you know, I'm pretty sure Denzel's come to work some days, like, let me stop playing. Because Viola is, <laughs> when they was doing fans, let me stop playing. You know, hey, listen, I don't think anybody, honestly, I don't think anybody's doing it better than than Viola right now. Yeah, she's yeah. she's on top, man. Killing it. Killing it. Hey, well, uh, go ahead and uh, tell the people where they can follow you, man. Okay. Yeah. Um. <laughs> you don't use social media. <laughs> I don't really use social media like oh, that. They can follow you. Nah, all right. So so Twitter, Twitter. It's I don't even know my handle. Um, I'm verified though. So if you find Chris Green and it's a blue check, that's me. Uh, so Twitter, I'll be on there primarily. Instagram, I think it's I'm Chris Green on Instagram, G R E E N E. Um, just go on Troy's page and yeah, just go on Troy's page and find me. Um, I don't be on Instagram like that though. I'm be honest with you, I, I don't really rock with Instagram like that. I got a Facebook fan page, like the the page for my brand. Um, up, it, it gets posted on me once in a while, but I'm not really on Facebook like that. Like I literally don't have it's that fan page. So your best bet is to get me on Twitter or Instagram. You can holler at the DMs. I'll reply to you and all that good stuff. You know. <laughs> But Twitter is where you catch me at. Like, I'm very social on Twitter because I like, I just like the platform. I can say what I got to say and get off of there. And if I don't like you, I can block you. Um, so <laughs> that's how you, how you get at me. But, uh, or just, you know, if you see me out in the street, say what's up. I'm not one of these actors that's like, ooh, don't talk to me. Like, I like, clearly, like chatting. So I'm good with that. <laughs> um, uh, where else you can find me is on iTunes, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu. Just look on my IMDb and watch all those shows. Thank you. I appreciate it. Residuals need to come in. <laughs> thank you. Hey, that's what's up, man. Well, it's been a great show. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in to Limelight Conversations. And uh, join us next time with another special guest. At the end of the day, you guys go to the movies or you watch something on TV to escape your reality to come into ours. Um, and that's our job is to tell you a story to make you forget about your problems, um, whatever they may be, if they're big or small. You know, if you go to see a comedy, you want to laugh. You want to forget about what's going on. You want to laugh at something and feel good about it. If you go to see a drama, it's not necessarily that you want to feel sad. You just want to, there's something about you that wants to connect to. You saw the trailer and go, yeah, my love life was like that. I want to see how he or she got out of that. Or an amazing sports story. Like everybody loves a sports story. You know, everybody wants to go and see the underdog win. And, and it makes you feel good about, you know, yourself. So those actors have to tap into that truth and, and, and honesty.